Hello and welcome to the Nesson Soccer Podcast. I am Mark, along with Marcus. My voice is still gone. <laughs> there are updates, Marcus, that I'll tell you about after the show. I don't think we have to get into it on the show. Um, don't want to worry anybody. Not that anybody should be worried. Uh, I'm sure the listeners are as concerned as I am. <laughs> uh, for the last several podcasts, your voice has not been. Yeah. Uh, but I feel great. I'm very excited for summer and soccer. And in this episode of the Nesson Soccer Podcast, we'll focus a lot on Liverpool and their Champions League final and their quest for the Premier League title and an upcoming interview in this show with Vladimir Smitzer. And that was done by you. We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. But first, we're going to hit on Tottenham versus Ajax in the Champions League semifinal second leg. Tottenham, last second goal, a buzzer beater, I guess you'd say. Yeah. But um, just an incredible, like, soccer fans were blessed with Champions League semifinal second legs. And I would say they kind of erased, not that it was dull, but just nothing all that crazy had happened in the Champions League up until this point, with the exception of. I guess Juventus being knocked out. Uh, that is wildly <laughs> inaccurate. What are you talking about? What the, was so crazy? The Champions League. Or, all right, I'm going to bring it up. Uh, Champions League this season, we have had in the knockout rounds. There was Man United. Well, I, I'd like to go in order just to <laughs> emphasize how. Are you uh, going to say Man United? How how wrong you are. Well, okay, so PSG loses, but they didn't have Neymar. In the knockout round, we had Ajax beating Real Madrid, okay, yeah, the three-time defending champions in the round of 16. Juventus coming back from 2-0 down to beat Atletico Madrid in the round of 16. Mm. Man United coming back from 2-0 down to knock PSG out in the round of 16. I really just said all this so you could just set up Porto what, what, what has actually happened. Beating your Roma Ugh. in extra time that in the awful. round of 16. That was just a deplorable. Tottenham effort. Man City in the quarterfinals. One of the craziest games we've ever seen in the second leg. Ajax beating Juventus, a Champions League favorite, in the quarterfinal. Barcelona and Liverpool killing Man United and Porto. Nothing crazy there. The Champions League knockout rounds this year have been incredible. Okay, I just wanted to set you up to give us a recap of how it's gone. Well, well, <laughs> well done. That's my story, and I'm sticking to and it. You, and you also wanted to make me mad early, <laughs> early in Get the you fired yeah, up, yeah, Marcus. yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah. Well, the second leg from Tottenham came into the game down 1-0, fell down 3-0 on aggregate. Yeah. Scored three goals in the second half to win on away goals. Heartbreaking for Ajax, who were kind of the little engine that could, of sorts. Yeah. Um, uh, they were the darlings of most uh, neutrals. Yes. At this point in the competition. And I had a, you know, at halftime, Tottenham was down 2 0. No Harry Kane. No Harry Kane. Yeah. And I uh, made a flipping comment that Tottenham seemed to have went to Amsterdam and got stoned like everybody else does. <laughs> and then in the second half, everything changed. Yeah. Um, I forget who scored the early goals for, um, for Tottenham. I mean, it was so long ago. It was... Lucas Mora scored a hat trick. Lucas scored all three goals? Yeah. Wow. 55th minute, 59th minute, and then the 90th. So, yes, Tottenham without their best 96th. player. Sorry, yes, 96th <laughs> minute. Six minute of extra time. Without their best player, Harry Kane, Lucas Mora, who has been in and out of the lineup, but uh, lately he's been more in than out. Yeah. He was a guy that uh, when PSG bought him from uh, a Brazilian club that I don't remember, he was supposed to be the man, and he kind of flopped 
at right. PSG. Tottenham got him, and he looked like a flop for – he's looked like a flop for most of his Tottenham career until the last six months or so. Uh, Lucas Moura rescues them. I saw a bit of the second half, and uh, I was startled by Ajax's lack of maturity, mm. um, the lack of poise. Uh, you know, there's one thing to go down 2-0. Ajax kept coming. Credit to them. They kept coming, looking for that third goal in the game, and they had a couple chances that came close. But, um, you know, when it came time, when... You, you expect European teams at this stage of the competition to be able to lock it up for the last 15, 20 minutes. It was not the uh, case. There was a ga- <laughs> uh, 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 game management and maturity. It was just pure chaos, end-to-end stuff. Wonderful entertainment, but I'm sure coaches everywhere would have been pulling their hair out because, right. uh, you know, Ajax having, sending five, six guys forward in stoppage time, hunting for that third goal. Uh, you know, I was watching myself just saying, get the ball, keep the ball. But right. that's not what took Ajax to this point, and they went down their way. Well, what a run for And it them. bears mentioning that they were by far the youngest team in the competition, so right, yeah. lack of maturity at a key moment is no big surprise. A miracle run comes to an end, but... Tottenham advances to their first Champions League final ever, so this is Which uncharted is territory. Wild. Yeah, that's pretty surprising to hear. Yeah. But uncharted territory for them too, and now we have a full Premier League Champions League final and full Premier League Europa League final. So just really grinding the gears of the rest of Europe uh, this year. This uh, Premier League. Uh, does it? I don't know. I think they've all sort it grinds of grinds my gears. gears. <laughs> and you're speaking on behalf of Europe? Sure. <laughs> Mark, you go to Germany for a week, and now all of a sudden yes, you're, we, we'll get you're, to you're Claude later. Juncker, your <laughs> your European Union chairman, Donald Tusk, all of a sudden. Uh, no. Um, I have a feeling that the rest of Europe has, actually this is, you know, we can almost say this as a fact, they've accepted the financial dominance of Premier League clubs and for yeah. years and years uh, you know we used to say these guys are underachieving there's so much money in this league See, these clubs are just flush with cash and they can't beat Barcelona and Real Madrid um, and what it came down to was Messi and Ronaldo in their primes right Messi and Ronaldo no longer are in their primes right and so their teams can be beaten uh, and these English teams are good um, yeah they're good Liverpool for the last 18 months has been playing they've been arguably the best team in the world in the world yeah uh, Tottenham steadily improving Arsenal and Chelsea uh, <laughs> being in the Europa League I will not put them in their in, in the same weight class of course as not. Liverpool yeah. and Tottenham uh, they have a long way to go I think it's just a testament to the league that they were both able to make to the final, though. Yes, even in their down years, yeah. they can still beat other teams in Europe that are having good seasons. So, yeah. um, Okay, well, let's move on to Liverpool beating Barcelona. Yeah. We'll get to this interview quickly, but I think everybody knows the story. It's one of the most, even more incredible, I guess, than Tottenham defeating Ajax. And yes. Barcelona collapses in the second leg for the second time in two years. But also, did they have another collapse pretty recently in the last three or four years? Um, I'm sure they have. Maybe it, I don't think it was as dramatic as this year or last year. Yeah, but yeah. There was the loss to Roma. Yeah. And then there was the loss to Liverpool. Back-to-back years. Uh, Barcelona, you know, I was comparing them to the... Boston Celtics where everybody wants to blame Kyrie Irving Mm. Uh, everybody wants to say he didn't get the job done you know people are turning their sights to Messi and saying he can't he can't bring it anymore and his uh, I think this result just shows that like the Boston Celtics the supporting cast of these superstar players are nowhere near as good 
as we might have thought they were. Yeah. Um, guys like Philippe Coutinho, guys like Usman Dembele, uh, Ivan Rakitic was terrible in that game. And the coach, Ernesto Valverde, comes in, wins two leagues. Maybe he'll get a double this year, but just shown in the biggest stage there is in club soccer, he's just not up to it. We love Brad Stevens. <laughs> this is now the Nesson Celtics podcast, but yeah. we love Brad Stevens. Maybe he's not as good as, as we thought. think he is. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, the Celtics have been on my mind this week. Right. And, uh, yeah, Barcelona, like Ajax, epic collapse. Credit to Tottenham and Liverpool, but you can't have these comebacks without just mental huge failure collapse. Yeah. Uh, it's the only word I can think of. Barcelona came in with a 3-0 lead, and they gave up one early goal to Divock Origi. Uh, that was probably five, six minutes into the game. Gave up two goals early in the second half to uh, Gini Wijnaldum, uh, two minutes apart. And, yeah, you just expect better from players that are playing at big clubs at this stage of European soccer's elite yeah. club competition. Um, you know, these guys are the ones that are supposed to be battle-tested, supposed to be the mentally toughest players. And uh, they went to Anfield and, you know, they were quaking in their boots. You give up an early goal, that says something about your mentality. You give up a goal early in the second half, it says something about your mentality. It's not mm -hmm. a fitness thing. Right. It's only 10 minutes into the half. You're supposed to be able to right. do the running. Yeah. So once they gave up three, you know, you kind of always felt like the fourth goal was inevitable. Yeah, and once Liverpool point. scored four, yeah, absent Lionel Messi playing God, which he was not in that game, right. uh, there was nothing Barcelona could do. Even at the end of the game, when Barcelona was trying to score again, it was just like Messi and like a few other players were just like sitting at like the top of the 18, just waiting for the ball to come to them. There was no sort of yeah. signature Barcelona flow and, and create creativity going they, on. They were not, they, they were they were not that game, yeah. uh, at least in terms of being protagonists. No. They were reacting to everything and paid the ultimate price, which comes in memes. <laughs> the memes have been killing Barcelona, and rightfully so. Yeah. And they've been hilarious, <laughs> including one that I saw, which said Barcelona next season, first leg. Uh, this was on the soccer memes. Uh, it's a great Facebook account you should follow. Yeah. It says next season, Barcelona 10-0 against Dortmund in the first leg, and then they <laughs> lose the second leg 11-0. <laughs> so, yeah, there's uh, Barcelona's been, they're, they're the butt of jokes, and they deserve it. Okay, so... Liverpool, though, on the other hand, of course, now in the Champions League final versus Tottenham, but also with a chance to win the Premier League this weekend. They are one point behind Man City entering the weekend. Yes. So, obviously, a Liverpool win, Man City loss gives them the title. Or a draw. Or a Man City draw, and a Liverpool win gives them the title. Yep. Uh, I'm not sure of the scenario with a Liverpool draw. Won't happen. <laughs> Liverpool needs loss. to win. Yeah, don't get bogged down in yeah. in that tar pit. Right. Uh, I, I mean, I it Liverpool will win. Man City, I expect them to win too, with the league on the line. You said Liverpool will win. Yeah. And Man City, you expect to win. I think they'll. Bo I think why, they'll. Why both the win. qualifier? Will Man City? win, lose, or draw on Sunday? They'll win. I think Man City wins the Premier League. Okay. I mean, they're at Brighton. Yeah. And Brighton is not good and doesn't have anything to play for because they've clinched. They're the last team to stay up. They're yeah. 17th. Brighton's and they've clinched that. Yeah. Uh, while Liverpool hosts Wolves, they'll probably beat them, but Wolves is a better opponent. But Wolves... I guess has also clinched European play. Wolves are lethal against or top six opponents this year. They haven't clinched European. Yeah. Wolves also have nothing to play for. So, 
I would expect them both to win, and uh, that's fine. Liverpool will finish second in the Premier League, which is a great season, especially if they win the Champions League final. 97 points, which yeah. would be good enough to win the Premier League Most in years. all but two seasons. Really? Last season and this one. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, so we, we promised we were going to get to the Vladimir Schmitzer yes. interview quickly. I don't think we've done that, but... No. Marcus, do you want to set it up real quick? Sure. Vladimir Smitzer, uh, for lack of a better phrase, fell into my lap this week. Uh, we want to thank the good people at Elevate who uh, set him up. Uh, he's doing uh, some promotional work in conjunction with Liverpool's U.S. tour this summer. Uh, they're coming for three games in July, including one at Fenway Park on July the 21st against Sevilla. Vladimir Smitzer played between 1999 and 2005 for Liverpool, was on their cup treble winning team in 2001, and he was part of the miracle comeback in Istanbul. Uh, they were down 3-0 against AC Milan. Steven Gerrard scored shortly in the second, uh, into the second half. Smitzer scored two minutes later, and uh, I found all these little parallels between Liverpool's come back then and Liverpool's come back now. Uh, I want to thank Vladimir for, uh, you know, for joining us and doing the interview. It was great. He talked about Liverpool's comeback against Barcelona. He talked about uh, Liverpool's chances in the Premier League, uh, what the Champions League final will be like, and uh, what he's expecting from Liverpool's trip this summer. So, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's just get right into it. Joining us this week on the Nesson Soccer Podcast, we have a very special guest, uh, Vladimir Smitzer, who is a Liverpool hero. Uh, he played from 1999 to 2005, uh, best known for scoring Liverpool's second goal and the winning penalty in the shootout in the 2005 Champions League final win over AC Milan. Yes, we're talking about the miracle at Istanbul. Uh, Vladdy, thank you for joining us. Yes, hello, thank you. No problem. Are you still buzzing from Tuesday's uh, Tuesday's comeback against Barcelona? Oh yes, uh, I'm still buzzing because you know it was an incredible night, and uh, we, you know the scenario. We we, we lost uh, we lost first game three 0 and uh, against Barcelona team, very strong team. So I think we maybe didn't deserve to to lose three 0 So I, we just didn't score goal at Barcelona at Nou Camp, and. Uh, I knew if he can score early, early goal, probably you know in second game we still have a chance. And uh, the players, they they did absolutely fantastic performance. They they played so well, and uh, we were rewarded by uh, by qualification for the final. Now I'm really happy we got to talk to you because you were there on the field in 2005, the last time uh, Liverpool had a comeback like this. Uh, you know, so I'm trying to I'm trying to rank the greatest Champions League comebacks of all time. Uh, Tuesday night's win over Barcelona was right up there with the miracle of Istanbul. Can you compare how improbable the comeback was uh, Tuesday against Barcelona versus the comeback against okay. AC Milan in 2005? How much of a surprise was it? Yeah, I would like to say it's, it's pretty the same, you know, because... Uh, uh, <laughs> You know, we were final down at halftime. Okay, we had only 45 minutes, but uh, the, the boys they they, they had the pretty same scenario, final down, and they had 90 minutes. But uh, you know, the way both teams react uh, and play the the rest of the of the game or 90 minutes uh, against Barcelona, and we played 45 minutes against Milan uh, was pretty same. We 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 gave everything. Now and it... we were uh, we will be rewarded and. Uh, I think it's pretty same level. You can just feel these things can happen probably maybe only at Antil or maybe maybe for this club, for Liverpool Football Club, because in in the past in the history we we had already a few games like this, and uh, we know we are capable of uh, doing uh, these crazy games. And uh, of course uh, the lads uh, they had a little bit advantage. They, this time they play they play at, at Antil, you know, they play at home. So with the atmosphere, uh, Barcelona players, they were a little bit shaking, a little bit, they, they did some mistakes and uh, we punished them. And uh, maybe the difference between uh, our team and uh, this current team was maybe that was the, for us it was the final. At the end we received the trophy, this time the players, they received the qualification for the final, they have they, they chance now to play the final and uh, 
win the trophy in the next game. So, but emotionally, I think uh, in 2005 I was on the pitch. This time I was standing, uh, you know, on the stands, and it was for me it was the same. It wow. Was, so good, so nice, you know, pretty safe for me. Okay, now another similarity I, I, I uh, pointed out, or that I want to point out, there were 122 seconds between Jeannie Wijnaldum's goals on uh, Tuesday. You scored yes. two minutes after Steven Gerrard scored uh, to bring you back 3-1 to one against AC Milan. Uh, what, 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 is the mentality, what is the mentality on the field when a team gets one goal and then quickly gets another one. Can you explain how that can happen, uh, especially at that level, the elite level? Yeah, it's. Uh, I remember when Stevie G scored the first one, uh, then we said, okay, it's, it's, it's good. It gives, it gives us something, some, some confidence. And uh, of course, uh, my second goal was like uh, another like injection of energy to, to, our, to ourselves, you know, to our heads. And uh, suddenly we, we were starting believing that uh, we can really still win the game, not just play it till the end just for something but he just knew we can we can still win the game so uh it was massive boost and it gives like it gave us like momentum you know you felt like everything is going to our way so we were starting to win the duels you know the battles individually and uh, because of that we at the end we scored the third one quite soon and uh, it was a little bit the same with uh, Gino Leonardo when he when he scored the first one but the second one was really killer for Barcelona because uh, our players they knew it's now it was like three nil three nil it was three three in uh, in uh, both games and uh, played at home in front of our fans. Uh, I think at that moment when he scored the second one, we knew we, they were qualified. They 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 were ready to to in their heads and uh, then uh, it was just question of time when they going to before they going to score the fourth one. Yes. Now we used to say that two zero is the most dangerous lead in soccer. Is three zero the new two zero? Yeah. Well, well, three zero. It's just crazy what happens at the moment in in European football because you see the yesterday game uh, Tottenham, you know, against Ajax. It, it it's just uh, you know saying that the, from three zero down from no cap you can still one four nil. It's, I don't know. It's crazy. It's crazy. It never happened before many times, you know. And suddenly it's happened. It's happened. But it's tough to explain how 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 it comes, you know. How it, yeah, how two, it arrive. two days in a row. Uh, now, years ago, three or four years ago, we uh, we used to write about how uh, English football was uh, far below uh, the standard in Europe, yes. where uh, Barcelona and Real Madrid, Atletico Madrid, Bayern Munich were flying far ahead of the English clubs. Now we have a Champions League final with two English clubs, uh, and there's a possibility of two English clubs in the Europa League final. Um, and this is what, what does this say about the state of English football? Is English football back on top of the world? Oh yes, I think yes because uh, I think the Premier League uh, it's really the best league in the world. Uh, I think uh, the top six teams at the moment uh, from the Premier League, four of them. Four out of six can play the European Cup finals, so it shows you the quality of what English teams they have. And uh, I think because uh, you know, a Premier League they, they sign very good contract with TV rights, and uh, they can really uh, attract uh, a lot of a lot of good players, you know. And uh, they can choose from uh, practically anyone in the world to, to play for them, and uh, uh, that's that's why. And uh, the English, uh, like I would like to say, the atmosphere at the stadiums and the fans. You know, I, for me, the Premier League is the best league in the world, and I was just surprised it didn't show the results earlier than, than this year. You know, this year it's really uh, they all the teams are dominant in Europe. But uh, last few years ago, I, I was surprised they didn't make it uh, further in, the, in these competitions, European competitions. But I knew the quality of the English teams. You know. Right. Now, uh, Liverpool is not only going for the Champions League, but we're, uh, before we get into the Champions League final, I'd like to talk about uh, Liverpool. The, the dream of winning the Premier League is still alive yeah. uh, for the first time in 29 years. Sunday, 10 a.m. Eastern, Liverpool host Wolves at Anfield. Manchester City holding that one-point lead. They visit Brighton. Uh, do nights like Tuesday's comeback against Barcelona, does that suggest for you that maybe destiny is on Liverpool's side? Yes, why not? 
but we, we all hope, you know, because unfortunately it's not in our hands, you know, it's, uh, well, favorite positions, of course, is uh, the guys from Manchester City, they, they need to win their game and uh, that's it, but uh, I don't know, it seems like uh, maybe something can happen because, uh, uh, you know, I think we scored the uh, last game against Newcastle, we scored like five minutes before the end of the game and and especially now with the with the win against Barcelona, it gave us I think again or the hope, the the boost, the more pressure on Manchester City because they can feel that we are still behind them all you know, and we are waiting for their mistakes. So <laughs> I just hope uh, I just wish that, that we can be rewarded this year because uh we play really well. Uh, we have we had a great season, to be honest, really good season, and uh, we may finish the the league with 97 points. This incredible, uh, you know, amount of points, and still come or finish second, which is crazy. Which is really crazy. But we'll see. We'll see. I'm uh, really looking forward this weekend to see. Uh, we need to concentrate on of first uh, on our results. You know, we need to win. Also, they they were pretty, playing pretty well, so be careful. We need, we need to be careful and uh, waiting for the results from Brighton. Right now, would you define Liverpool's season as successful, no matter what happens uh, Sunday in the league? Uh, you know, you talked about ninety-seven points. That's good enough to win the Premier League in uh, every season except for one, yeah. which would be well, it would be yes. two uh, this year. Um, so would would you say that this season has been a smashing success uh, no matter what happens on Sunday and in the Champions League final on June 1st? Yes, for me for me this season was definitely a success. Uh, I know I know the the fans some fans they are asking the trophies trophies but you know the way the first team played this whole season it's been really good. I enjoy to watch them and uh, they were entertainment, you know, it they they play offensive football. They are scoring the goals, and uh, for me, it, it, it's been success. And I'm still hoping at least one trophy we will bring this this season back to Anfield. Okay. So uh, yes, for me, it, you know, we, we last year I think we were I don't know 15, 17 points behind Manchester City, and look now it's we, we are in a situation where we are only one point behind them last game of the season. So we we made a, a massive progress, a big progress, and. Uh, that's why I think it's, it, it has to be called a like successful season. Okay, now I want to fast forward to June 1st, the Champions League final in Madrid versus Tottenham. Uh, Tottenham had, a, uh, had an incredible comeback of their own, uh, three goals in the second half, and uh, these are two teams that know each other well. Uh, what are your early thoughts on that matchup? <laughs> well, uh, I think I, I wanted to play rather Ajax than, than Tottenham because, you know, I I don't like too much the finals where two teams from one country one country playing against each other. But we can't choose, it's Tottenham and I I think our team should be confident because uh, we played them a few times and uh, I think we will be confident that we can we can beat them, especially after the Barcelona game and uh, I think Liverpool will be a little bit favoured of this game. Of right. course, in the final uh, you know, it's pretty, pretty chance. It's like pretty good. It is one game a week, you know, and uh, that's, that's that's good enough for us to recover the week. Uh, usually, we play even like uh, two games a week. So, yeah, it's going to be different. And uh, I just hope Jurgen uh, Klopp will find a way really prepare well the team. It's it's going to be same for for us and for Tottenham. So that's a good thing. It's uh, it's there's no advantage for one uh, or. Uh, second team, you know, it's the same conditions. And uh, I think, uh, I remember when in 2005 we had, I think, 10 days and it was enough. 10 days was enough for a while. So I think good thing, only one good thing about this, it's the same for Tottenham. So both teams, they will have the same time for preparation and uh, we'll see who be, who, be, who, will, who will be prepared better. But I, am, I have a plenty of confidence to staff, uh, coaching staff, uh, of Liverpool football club that they they prepare well the boys you know and uh, and we can recover because we got some knocks some injuries so maybe it's a good uh, good uh, mess good good message for or uh, good news for our team that uh, everyone will be really ready for the final. Yes, and on the other side, and uh, that leads into my next question was with this gap 
you'll probably see the return of Andy Robertson, Mohamed Salah, Roberto Firmino might be okay. And then on the other side, Harry Kane has been out since uh, since uh, Tottenham's Tottenham's uh, last round of the Champions League. Yeah. So I think for the neutral, the yeah. spectacle will be uh, much brighter. No, but you know, if you're going to be the best in the in the in Europe, if you win the trophy, come on, let's let's win it against strong team. You know, I, I would like to see Kane playing. I know maybe we, if you got better chance to. Uh, if he play, if Tottenham is playing without him, but I like uh, to to be the strong Tottenham team with all the players fit, you know, uh, uh, that's then you have even more credit for winning the trophy, trophy, you know. So uh, I just hope uh, all the boys from outing can be available for this final, and and uh, same for for Tottenham. Uh, I just want to play like fair game, you know, not that hoping that. Kane uh, will be still injured and it's going to be more easy for us. Now I want to fast forward to this summer. Liverpool is coming back to Boston for the third time in eight years. Uh, They will play Sevilla June 21st at Fenway Park. Uh, Have you ever been to Boston? No, no, I've never been in Boston and even I I really wanted to go uh, this winter because, you know, uh, uh, for... Boston Bruins is playing uh, Pasternak and uh, Krejci, you know, ice hockey players. Oh, yes, yes. And, uh, I'm, and I am a big fan of ice hockey. I, I, myself, I play ice hockey, so, and, they, and Pasternak is very good, my friend. So I wanted to visit him. I couldn't find uh, the time to do it. So, and now I'm wishing them, I'm following them on, uh, on, the, on, the, on this playoffs. Now they're in the final of the conference. So, uh, Hopefully, I, but I've never been in Boston. It's going to be my first time I, I, I will visit Boston. Hopefully, you'll be like Stanley Cup champions this year. Yes, yes. How do you how do you like their chances for uh, winning the cup? They're uh, they're they're one round away from the final. Um, on the other side, they they have to be among the favorites. Uh, are are you excited as a uh, Bruins yes. fan about it? Yes, yes, yeah, very exciting because uh, as I said, uh, because of these two guys and uh, I like Patrice Bergeron. Uh, and Belshant and the still you have plenty of young players you know at the, at the, at the back uh, McAvoy and I, I know the roster very well don't worry so, <laughs> so, uh, and uh, I yeah I think across that they can make it uh, Carolina is a, a tough opponent they they, they, they play well uh, they, they, they beat Washington Capitals in the first round it was, it was surprising but signs uh, they play really well uh, it'll be tough it'll be tough but they have uh, they have enough power to to beat them and to go to the final. Oh. Marines. Well, back to uh, back to the the beautiful game. What are you expecting uh, when yes. Liverpool when Liverpool takes on Sevilla at Fenway Park? Uh, there's a historic venue in uh, here in Boston. Yes, uh, well, I expect uh, I expect uh, a very good game because Sevilla is a uh, old classic uh, Spanish team. You know they they play really well. Uh, uh, it's always good football when you play them. You must be careful. Spanish players are very skillful, so I, I expect uh, to to have a to have a really good game. Both teams be it, it be you know like preseason, so you can see all the players. You can always see not only eleven playing, but it'll always like more players, and it's good because at Fenway Park, uh, I, I like to see it. You know, uh, it's an iconic venue of uh, American sport, and I never been there, so. I just hope it's going to be great. Well, we look forward to having you here, and I want to thank you very much for taking the time to join us this week on the Nesson Soccer Podcast. Okay, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, take care. All right. Well, that covered a lot of topics. Thank you to Vladimir for joining us. And Marcus, you did the interview. Did anything really strike you of what Smitzer had to say? Uh, yes, I could hear, um, I think he was in the Czech Republic, uh, I could hear the real excitement um, that, you know, Smitzer is a former player, been around the block, played uh, in the European Championship semifinals, played in UEFA Cup finals, Champions League finals, um, and you know what he sounded like? A fan like everybody else yeah. uh, you know he was my first question was like are you still buzzing and he said oh yeah he's um, you know this has to be this is easily the most exciting week or period in Liverpool's history 
since Fenway Sports Group acquired the club in 2010. And, you know, that is everywhere. You talk to Liverpool fans anywhere, they are bouncing, they're buzzing, and, uh, yeah, they deserve to be. So, you know, it, it, I, I didn't expect, I expected Smitsu to be a little more, maybe that's, I'm stereotyping Eastern Europeans, but maybe a little more stoic and, sure, yeah. you know, uh, like, yes, yes, they we haven't won anything yet, and, you know, they're still, you know, kind of like that hard man, but he was... Uh, you know, he, he said so, he said he watched the game, the Barcelona game. He was there at Anfield, and he was in the stand. So, you know, I could the the energy that he has, and you know, the interview we did less than forty eight hours after the game. So, um, I could really just hear the excitement, and um, you know, it, it, there's just excitement around the club, and he embodied it for me. All right. Well, I think that sort of wraps our Liverpool. Champions League talk. Looking forward for Liverpool, they play on Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern, along with every Premier League club plays Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern. Yep. Final match day of the Premier League, and then the Champions League final. Ugh, what is it? June 1st in Madrid against Tottenham Hotspur. Three o'clock Eastern. Three o'clock. So that are that's your Liverpool schedule, but. Some some news back back in the U.S. in New England, uh, kind of some really disappointing news. Brad Friedel was fired, relieved of his duties as New England Revolution head coach. We wanted to talk about this quickly. I, from my perspective, Brad Friedel was obviously an exciting name when he was first hired less than two years ago, and. They kind of brought some change to the roster, which hadn't seen much change recently, at least in the last few years. And the team hadn't done all that well, the revolution. So it was kind of encouraging that, okay, maybe they've, you know, there's a new style for the revs and they're gonna, you know, it's gonna shine through in results. Well, those results on the field have been catastrophic. Most recently, their last two games, they've lost a combined score of 11 to one. Um, and they're in last place in the Eastern Conference. And I think it was pretty quick tenure, especially for a revolution coach, who probably has a little more time than the typical, even MLS coach. But he was so bad, that, or the team was so bad that they just moved on as quickly as possible. Yeah. Um. I interviewed Brad Friedel uh, at the beginning of the season. I think it was after the first game. And, you know, what I took from it was a sense of confidence, uh, a sense of somebody being, um, you know, sure of what he was doing and where the team was going. They, they ended last season poorly. And, you know, it, just from what I got from speaking with him, and I have to admit that, you know, I think anybody certainly I have to admit that I have not followed the revolution closely during his tenure. And somebody asked me what I thought about Brad Friedel as a coach. And I said, well, I haven't really seen the team play, but uh, you know, the results kind of speak for themselves. So right. I, you know, I couldn't talk about the style and you know, break down how the team plays, but you could just look at what was going on um, you know, in the last, Spanning the last 26 games, five wins, 17 losses, yeah. four draws. That's going know? back into last season. Yes, going yeah. back. Uh, yeah, going back to the end of last season. So he started out okay at the beginning of 2018, and then um, wheels came off. Yeah, I guess. and I'm not quite sure what happened, uh, why it happened, but there was a tweet from Julian Cardillo who uh, does some work freelance. Um, at Pro Soccer USA and other outlets, he says, a source told me this morning Friedel was out. Needed more, one more to break it. One more source. Was also told that Friedel had lost the locker room and that this group is itching for a clean slate slash fresh start. There's a belief that the Revs players are better than their record suggests. <laughs> Can't be much worse. <laughs> no. Um, and that's something, you know, you've heard. I've heard it three times now in yeah. recent years 
months. I'm uh, sure they are, but I, you know, I don't expect them to go on some sort of massive run. But yeah, yeah, but you know, this core group has also missed the playoffs every year since 2015, I believe, which is one of which is maybe the longest gap in the club history and one of the longest in MLS history, where just about every team will get into the playoffs over any given three-year yeah. period. So, sure, um, you know, the 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 last line, the belief that the Revs players are better than the record suggests. Uh, I saw it in Real Madrid's statement when they fired uh, Julen Lopetegui, yeah. I think. Um, you know, they said they're World Cup runner-ups and Ballon d'Or winners, and you know, this team, the players are a lot better, so that blames the coach. Saw it when uh, FC Cincinnati fired their coach this week. That's your team, isn't it? <laughs> uh, fired their coach this week. It said these players are much better than the record suggests. That was in the official statement. Yeah. This here is in a report that was broken via Twitter. Uh, you know, it's not a statement itself, but also there's a belief that the Revs players are better than the records are suggesting. So, yeah, that puts the blame squarely on the coach. Um, I do not know exactly what went wrong, but as I said, the results speak for themselves. Selves specifically the last four games, April 24th, a 3-0 loss to Montreal when Montreal arrived at the stadium late, barely had time to warm up. Right. Uh, three days later, a 4-4 uh, draw against Sporting Kansas City. Then uh, a week after that, May 4th, the 6-1 loss to Philadelphia. And then four days later, a 5-0 loss to the Chicago Fire. Uh, two games, 11-1. to You know, I was, one of our colleagues, Nesson colleagues, asked me about them after the loss to Chicago, and I said, Friedel's position is probably untenable at this point, and he was gone hours later. Yeah. I think even if the team does perform, or if they continue to perform badly, it'll still be a good move to have gotten rid of Brad Friedel because he had a big part in a lot of the roster moves in the last 18 months. Yeah. And it's not as if he was handed some club that he really didn't have, you know, he didn't have much say in what the players would do, what was going on with player moves. Yes, but then so. there's also this core group yeah. who have been there. Um, well, know, a lot of them have group. been shipped off in the last couple uh, of That's not true. Um, so from from the from the you know the end of the Steve Nickel era and through the Jay Heaps era, you know they've been there a lot. Um, you know I don't know if I want to name names, but there are some who have been you know like a Juan Agadello, a, going in alphabetical order, not assigning blame per se, but just players that have been with this team for a while: Teal Bunbury, Scott Caldwell, yeah. um, Diego Fagundes, Andrew Farrell. Uh, so you're saying you put a lot of blame on these guys and as individuals? Um, no, uh, as as what, what I do in sports is I blame. I think the blame starts at the top. Uh, uh -huh. You have to look at the president Brian Bellello. You have to look at the technical director. I don't know if he's the director of soccer or the GM, Mike Burns. Um, this is a rot that is extended for years and years, uh, Friedel came in, you know, maybe he works in a different environment. Um, when I say works, like maybe he would succeed in a different environment, but there's something going on at the revolution that, uh, you know, really needs to change. And, you know, I saw on, uh, on social media yesterday, the Midnight Riders, um, who are the revolution's oldest and longest supporters group, came out and said, you know, why, while they welcome Brad Friedel's departure, they believe that they, it's basically a statement of no confidence yeah. in, uh, in Mike Burns. So, um, you know, somebody, I don't know who could come in and unite everybody and get all the players and uh, it's a big the job. players, the fans, and just the club, unite the club. I'm not sure who that could be, but uh, somebody needs to come in and do it because this team is 2-2-8 two, two and eight, and their playoff drought is looking to extend for some time. Yeah. Well, tough news for the Revs, but I think that wraps it up, except that quickly, I'm going to get into my Germany trip 
just because I don't think it requires much time. But recently, or last week I was in Germany, Marcus, you know this, mm -hmm. and as I've said before, anytime either of us attends a soccer match in person, we, I feel that we should talk about it. So I had two soccer experiences, yeah. or I guess more or less <laughs> two and a half soccer experiences while in Germany. First was watching the Liverpool-Barcelona first leg at a bar. I walked in with my brother. I guess I have an olive skin complexion, one might say. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to be a Liverpool bar from the outside. And we walked in and certainly it was entirely Liverpool fans in the room I walked into. And we were immediately told to go to the basement. And we got to the basement and it was all Barcelona fans. So first floor, Liverpool, basement, Barcelona, but an incredible atmosphere to watch a game. And then for that particular game, kind of good that we were with the Barcelona fans as my brother and I are both sort of neutrals in watching the game. Uh, fast forward to the last day I was in Germany and I attended Hamburg versus Ingolstadt, uh, Bundesliga second division match. Hamburg, is, as many people might know, is their first year not in the Bundesliga one yeah. in their entire history of the club. Right. And I don't know maybe the entire history of the Bundesliga. Maybe they hadn't been participating in every single season, but um, they are near the top of the table and had a chance to, I believe, clinch promotion or at least clinch the playoff spot for having the chance to then be promoted, maybe not the automatic spot. Uh, and they're facing Ingeslot, who is near the bottom of the second division table, and at home proceeded to get wiped off the field, losing three to nothing, one goal of which was a 90-yard counterattack by a single Ingeslot player. Effort. To, yeah. Lack it, thereof. Lack thereof. Um, and Hamburg fans, I'm a sold-out event, 50,000-seat stadium, they were not happy. A lot of booing, a lot of jeering, even uh, a good amount of people leaving early. And Marcus, I haven't told you this. As the game ended, the Hamburg fans, or the Hamburg players, sorry, walked off the pitch and were violently booed because they did not, by the supporter section, mm -hmm. which was all still there. Nobody had left the supporter section. Did not go and apologize. They did not go and, you know. Yeah, yeah, they do that. Every Germany. soccer game, they go and applaud the fans, win or lose or draw. Sure. Um, they did not and were violently booed. And n not three, four minutes later, the entire Hamburg team came back out onto the field. The entire team was off the field, not a single player. Then the entire team came back on. So in my mind, they must have been told by somebody, sure. you must go back out and acknowledge the fans. And then they come back out onto the pitch, go over to the fan section, s still being violently booed. And I... I don't know, I guess it was the team captain. I was at the under, other end of the stadium, so it was hard for me to see. But a couple of Hamburg players spoke, you know, like had conversations with, um, you know, it seemed to be a, a select couple of fans from the supporter section. Yeah. Those conversations lasted a couple of minutes and the atmosphere seemed to have calmed down slightly by the time they left. Mm -hmm. But as those conversations were happening, the rest of the team just kind of stood there and took this booing, um, which, I mean, they kind of deserved, or they did deserve, but sure. it was just all a very fascinating uh, just situation to witness, just how there was a legit, you know, communication and dialogue between the fans and the play. Something that, you know, you definitely don't really see in the United States in any sports. Yeah. Um, and I would... I don't know if it's just the certain size of club and tradition that Hamburg has, but I'm sure that not even every European club can say that they that that would happen. Uh, you've seen it. I've seen it in different places in Europe yeah. over the years. Uh, most recently in Italy, I can't remember who was saying what, who was involved. Um, I think two things are at play there. There's the intensity at which. Uh, you know, fans were feeling vitriolic and the players, you know, they, they can feel that because 
unlike soccer here, they live it. You know, when they lose right. at home, they have to go out in, out into the town for the rest of the week, and everybody knows who they are right. and how they did, and, you know, we'll have something to say about it. So, you know, you want to kind of quell that right away, if for no other reason than your own personal safety <laughs> out of your family. Right, uh, not even a joke. Yeah, so... Um. Yeah, I, I I don't think we really see that here, no. um, and it's probably for the best. But it makes for good television. Or yeah, no, whatever. I was captivated watching yes, from like yes. the other side of the stadium. <laughs> um, just couldn't really couldn't believe what I was seeing. Yeah, but yeah. So for anybody uh, heading to Germany, great soccer culture, obviously. Yeah. But thanks for joining us. On this edition of the Nesson Soccer Podcast, thanks again to Vladimir Smitzer. And uh, I guess good luck to Liverpool, um, because we sort of take their side here. (laughs) Please follow the podcast by searching uh, Nesson in iTunes. That's N-E-S-N in iTunes to follow the Nesson Soccer Podcast and all Nesson podcasts. And uh, we will see you next time.